Well, welcome to 2022. Uh, I took a little time off over the holidays in order to spend some time with my family and get my batteries recharged. So when I came back into the shop, I realized that there were some things about the foundry setup that I needed to change. One had to do with the uh, propane fuel, that I had some trouble with the tanks freezing up. And I'll discuss that a little later in the video. But the most important part was that I decided that the furnace needed to be vented to the outside. So in order to do that, I needed to find a spot that was near a clear story window so that I could get the stack to go outside without penetrating the roof. So the location that I chose actually happened to be where I had this big workbench sitting. So moving the workbench and then moving some shelves and doing a lot of other things, it just turned out to be a complete reorganization of the metalworking area of my shop. Uh, one of the things I did was I organized my shelves much better. And also I built a rack here uh, to store all the scrap steel and stuff in a much easier way that I could get my hands on it. So let me show you how this venting system works. So how this vent system works is that you can see I chose the spot because of the clear story window where it could go out and then on up outside. So what I've devised here is a system where I can take these clamps off of here. I mainly have this plywood on here to stop cold air from coming down when it's not in use. And then this will open over like so with some hinges and I put the clamps back on there. <clears throat> and then you can see it's directly over the uh, furnace so that it'll vent right up there. Now, one of the reasons why I chose this location is that just on the other side of this um, air compressor tank is a natural gas outlet. So that in the event, if I wanna fire the furnace with natural gas, uh, which I may do if, I, if the propane solution that I've come up with doesn't work, then I would definitely need an, uh, an event hood. Because uh, as most of you know, propane fumes, uh, it's okay to have propane running in an indoor environment. Um, however, when I was casting before, I could kind of, it just didn't smell quite right in here. So I always wore my big respirator. Now the problem with that is it's very hot. So that respirator, having it on for several hours was a bit of an, an annoyance. So I think this solution should work out pretty well. And we'll find out later on when I do the casting. So I'd promised last episode that I would run through the entire casting process explaining each step of the way and throwing in some of the terms and terminology needed in sand casting. So all of that's coming up on this episode of The Art of Boat Building. So the first part that I want to talk about is called the flask. And the flask is made up of two parts. The top part is called the cope, and the bottom part is called the drag. Now these two pieces come apart, like so, so that when you have your part in there, you can take it out of there in order to create the void for the casting. Now these, this line between the two is called a parting line. And a parting line can also be seen in a casting where a little excess material will squeeze out, which is called flashing. So flashing can be seen here in this offcut, so you can see exactly where the parting line was along there. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the sand. And the sand that I prefer is called green sand. And green sand is really a fast and cost-effective way to make quality castings uh, for bronze. Now, green sand is made up of silica sand, bentonite clay, and water. 
And it is referred to as green because it doesn't have any kind of additives in it. Uh, so it's really easily to be recycled and is good for the environment. So the green sand here that I have, you can see that it clumps very nicely and it doesn't stick to my hand. And that's really what we want. That's how we know that it's got the proper amount of water moisture in there. If it doesn't clump, then it's too dry. And if it sticks to my hand, then it's too wet. Now the way that I recycle this, because of course it dries out once the casting uh, occurs, then I take a water bottle and I just spritz it a little bit and then mix that up. So that's how I reconstitute the water back into the sand. So the other kind of sand is where oil replaces the water, and that's called petrobond. Now it has a less permeability to it, so a much, much finer sand can be used. Hence, you get a much smoother surface and it will pick up more detail. Now, typically, it's done for smaller objects like a jeweler would use. Now, the problem with petrobond is that once that hot metal hits it and that oil burns, there's a tremendous amount of smoke especially in larger castings like what I'm doing. So for me, green sand is the perfect choice, also because I can recycle that sand quite easily with just water. Now the sand that I'm using is 180 grit uh, sand, so it's actually pretty fine, and I'm really getting a really nice surface so far. So uh, I'm pretty happy with the green sand, and that's what we'll be using for our castings. So the next thing is the mold, and the mold is the structure for which the molten metal is poured into. So of course that is an empty void. In order to create that void in the sand, we need a positive uh, object in order to pack that sand around that. Now the first object that we would need would be the pattern. And the pattern is the exact replica of the part that you want to make. Now I've got here the cleat that I'm going to cast. And you can see it looks exactly the dimensions and everything that I want the cleat to be. Now patterns can be a solid piece like this, or they can be split patterns like this one. And a split pattern always divides right at the parting line. Now, because there isn't any area on here that the uh, mold will come off, the sand will come off of there, we need it to have a good draft to it. And a draft is where there isn't any undercut, so the sand can't get caught up underneath there, so that it's always open, so that that will slide right out of the sand easily. So a draft, if I were to draw a cube here, would be that it would have the slightly tapered edges like this. Now I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit here. So this would be where we would be putting the sand in on this side. And you can see then that we would be able to take that object out of the sand with that slight draft in there. Now that I've got the pattern, we now need to talk about the system in which we're going to get the metal through the mold to the pattern. And that's made up of a whole series of different parts. Now in the old days when I learned casting, we would simply cut channels into the sand using a spoon to get the metal in there. Uh, sometimes we'd even use a coffee can on top you know, for a funnel in order to get the metal into the, into the mold. Um, the problem with those things is they're pretty unpredictable results. Now, in order to get some more predictable results, uh, I came across this book by Professor John Campbell and a mini casting handbook. Now, I was turned on to this book by a fellow YouTuber, Perry Merritt. And Perry has a channel that is just dedicated to metal casting. Now, he's got a playlist, which I'm going to link up here, of nine different videos on how to cast metal, or learn to cast metal, I think is uh, what he calls it. Now those nine videos, if you were to watch all of them, it's about an hour and 45 minutes, but he's got them all broken down so that if you just want to know about sprues or you just want to know about runners, uh, you can check out those videos. 
Uh, I think the longest one maybe is 17 minutes long. Um, anyway, he's uh, pretty enjoyable to watch and uh, very informative. Now what I'm planning on doing here is to give you really kind of an overview of Professor Campbell's methods on getting a really uh, predictable casting, good predictable casting. So the goal is to produce a really high quality casting that is void of any defects. Now a term that we use for that is called porosity and porosity is when there's little holes or dimples or where the metal has shrunk upon itself. Uh, that's called porosity. So what we're going to do is to try to avoid that. Now one way is that we need to control and how the metal gets into the mold. And we want the metal to get in as efficiently as possible without introducing uh, too much air, which would cause turbulence. And we also want to control the rate in which it enters the mold. So if we don't control the rate, it can actually splash into the mold, which is going to cause porosity. But what we want it to do is to sort of roll into the mold so that it's just one kind of a wave of metal fills up that pattern. So there are a couple of ways that Professor Campbell has of addressing those. Uh, one is how the metal is introduced into the metal, and uh, how it's introduced into the mold, and the other is how the velocity is controlled. So the first thing we want to look at is the sprue. If we look here on page 45 of Professor Campbell's book, we can see that he has a diagram here of a free falling liquid. Now, if you pour any kind of liquid out of a pitcher, what it will do, it'll turn and it'll make itself into this sort of tapered shape. So what we want to do is to have our sprue mimic that tapered shape. Because the idea here is to not get any introduced any extra air in there. So if we have the shape of the sprue being this shape, then it'll eliminate a lot of that um, possibility. So the sprue that I've made looks like this, and you can see that it's very close to what that, um, those, that shape is. So this is the sprue that we'll be using. So here's a diagram of what our mold's going to look like. So right here is the sprue. Now this part is the basin, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But this is where the metal would start, come down the sprue, and then it'll go across a runner. Now the velocity of this metal is fairly quick, and what we want to do is to control how fast that metal enters the part. So what Professor Campbell has come up with is what he calls a vortex gate, or sometimes it's called a spin trap. And this is a system that once the metal will run in here and it spins, and so it slows its velocity. Now what that happens is that this is filled with metal, and then as it fills, it runs up into the gate, and this is called the gate, this flat piece here, that will enter into the piece. Now, the other thing that we have here is what's called a feeder or a riser. And what that does is that as this metal goes in here, if as this cools, it needs more metal, this is why this is called a feeder, is it will feed soft metal into here. Or I should say molten metal into here. So the riser or feeder must be a big enough diameter that it's bigger than any of the uh, diameters or thicknesses of the actual part. Now, this is an offcut from an earlier casting. Uh, so we have this, here's where the sprue came in and went across the runner here. And then you can see here's where the vortex gate or spin trap is. And then this is the uh, actual gate that goes into the piece. Now you can see the filler, how it depressed itself here, that it sucked that metal in as it was cooling. So what it did is it fed the part. Now the part, <clears throat> see if I can put this together here real quick so you can see. So the part was sitting here like this. So you can see this is the importance of the riser 
in the feeder. Um, it's a really good example of how it fed that much metal into the actual part. So if we look back at the diagram here, uh, you can see the, the vor vortex gate or spin trap has a vent that comes up so that when the metal comes in there, the gases can escape through that vent. Now the other thing is that the piece needs to be vented. So what I've got here, there's a couple of dashed lines coming here and here. Now the vents do not need to be very large for the actual piece. So you'll see when I start to put the sand together, the sand mold together, that where I'm going to basically just scratch a vent in there. Uh, and also, the other, other thing you can do is to stick a wire in on the high spots like this. Now, in the past, what I've done is I've used a welding wire, welding rod, uh, and went down and touched those two spots so that any gases that got in here, it pushed those out as the metal went in there. So the next thing we want to do is to talk about the basin. Now, the basin design is so if we have our sprue here like this and we have is an offset basin and so here's where our basin is going to be like so and what we want is a little ridge in here now the reason for that is that once the metal comes pouring in here it's going to want to splash out in two directions are all across there. And what we don't want is for the metal to come directly into the sprue and splash down in here. So by doing that, what happens is then that metal starts filling up in here and then it tumbles over the side of this so that once this fills, then this all fills down at the same rate. So this little ridge in here needs to be uh, probably about the thickness of my finger uh, in, in real time. So the basin also needs to have square edges down here so that it doesn't splash out. So if we had a basin that was round like this that came down, what would happen is the metal would just want to shoot back up out of there. So it's important that that basin have square edges on the bottom so that when the metal comes in, it stops and it slowly fills itself up and then it all comes down at one time. So this all become clear when I actually ram up the uh, mold into the sand. So that'll be the next step is to get this all rammed up. So the problem I was having with the propane tanks is about 25 minutes into the burn, the tank pressure was dropping. And so basically what it was doing was freezing up. So what I had to do was disconnect from one and reconnect to another and then run it. And then it froze up a little bit and then I had to switch back. So basically the melt takes about an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes. So with a little research, what I found out was, <clears throat> excuse me, that the gas in a propane tank, what you're using is the part that evaporates. Now when you pull a lot of BTUs, which of course we're doing with this furnace, I think it's close to 130 BTUs, then the evaporation can't keep up with the demand. So the solution is to have a larger area of evaporation. Now, interesting enough, you would think if you bought a bigger tank that that would help, but it has nothing to do with the tank amount of propane in it because it's this surface here that matters. So the solution that I found was to hook up a manifold. So I have a manifold here that I purchased. Um, I think typically they're used for uh, turkey fryers. So what I'm gonna do is hook this up with my gauge and um, then we'll run both tanks at the same time so we'll have double the amount of evaporation surface.
type of bronze I'll be using is silicon bronze. That's silicon, not to be confused with silicone, which is a polymer, as in caulk. Silicon is a natural element. This is primarily what sand is made up of. A silicon bronze alloy is a low lead brass alloy that is generally composed of 96% copper. The rest is made up of about 2.5 to 6% silicon and a mixture of a variety of other alloys such as manganese, tin, iron, or zinc. It's about the best bronze for an amateur foundry worker as it doesn't change composition with repeated remelting. It's known for its easy pouring ability, appealing surface finish, and being corrosive resistant. And depending on the thickness of the casting, it'll shrink around a negative 1.8% to 2.5%. This bronze is more resistant to water corrosion than brass, and is not only resistant to fresh water, but also salt water, fog, mist, alkalines, acids, and organic chemicals. It's also anti-biofouling, which makes it an excellent choice for marine applications. When you load the crucible up with bronze, it's called charging the crucible. So now that I've got that done, I can get the furnace started and we'll get this melt going. To get started ramming up, we use the drag portion of the flask and we put it with the parting side down. Now I'm getting the patterns out and arranging them in there. We want to make sure that we have at least an inch and a half or so from the outside. We put in the runner and I'm using the gate here in order to make sure that I have the runner and the pattern the right distance apart. Now once I get those all arranged, I put some parting compound or parting dust on top of it. Get a good coating of that. And then I'm going to get some sand and put it in a, a, a sieve here. And this is called riddling the sand. So we get a nice fine surface all over the part. I can then start putting handfuls of the sand on top of that. And once I get that in there, I start packing it down really tight and then use my ramming tool and start ramming that up. You want to really pack it in tight. And once I've got a layer on there, then it's a matter of putting another layer on and doing the same step several times until I get the flask full. I'm going to give it one final ramming up. Once that's completed, I take a piece of metal uh, bar here and it's called striking it off. So we want to get the bottom of the flask, which will be the bottom once we turn it over, uh, nice and smooth. So we'll do a little bit of cleanup and then flip it over. And then I take some time and I'll clean up the rest. So here's the piece turned over. So this is our drag. And now I need to start putting the um, cope side of the pattern in. Line up those little pins that I have with the two. Here I'm putting the gate in. And there's the spin trap or vortex gate. And this is the riser filler. And then the final thing is the sprue. So now I'm going to put the cope side of the flask on top. Some more powdering powder. Riddling again 
and basically following the same steps as I did on the drag portion. And I'm ramming it up here with a small piece of oak so that I was able to get in between the sprue, riser, and vent. And then I'm going to strike it off. And once we get it struck off, we can then remove the vent, the riser, and of course, finally the sprue. I'm now taking a tube here to cut a basin in for the pouring basin and taking a little trowel and cleaning it up. And once I get that cleaned up, I then need to cut the channel between the sprue and the basin. And in doing so, then I'm going to keep a little piece in there as that ridge that I had mentioned earlier. I'm using a small brush here to soften the ridge there a little bit. And then I'm using a welding rod to make some small vents on the high points of the pattern. I'm then ready to turn the mold over and separate the two halves. And once I get it separated, then we can start removing the pattern. I'm using a couple of screws here that I put in there, and I tap it a little bit to sort of loosen the pattern a little bit. And once I get that loose, it should lift right out. Sometimes you get a little tear out like that, but you can push it right back. And the worst case scenario is if I didn't, it would just be extra material that I'd have to grind off. So I'm doing here is putting what we call a scratch vent in, with the two long spots of the pattern here on both sides. And give it a quick dusting with some compressed air. And then it's ready to put the two halves back together. I'm clamping the cope and drag together here so that the pressure of the metal doesn't separate the two halves. I'm also adding some angle iron to the wooden flask to protect it from the hot crucible. After a little cleanup, I think we're ready to pour. I'm adding some flux to the metal here, which helps the impurities float to the top. That layer of scum is called dross. You can see me here scraping all of that off. I'm pouring off the extra here in an ingot mold. You never want molten metal to harden in your crucible. And a little scrape cleanup and ready to put back into the furnace. I'm dropping a piece of wet cardboard in there, which will create an ash layer in between the crucible and the plinth stone inside so that the crucible won't stick to it in a future casting. So it's been about three hours, so we'll break it open and see what we've got. It looks like it came out pretty good. So I've got all of the sand cleaned off of it now, so we can see all of the mold parts of the basin and the sprue, and the runner, the vortex gate, the gate, feeder, and of course now we can see our part. I'm running out of time this week, but in future videos I'll show how I cut the sprues and gates off and finish the bronze. Now, if you can't wait until then, you can check out uh, the last video where I cast a cleat, which I'll link up here. Now I'll need four cleats for the boat, so I've got two down and two to go. Well, next episode we'll start working on the pintle and the gudgeon for the rudder. Well, as always, thanks for watching, and remember, if you're going to make it, make it beautiful. <laughs>